Hi, I'm Bob McCoskery. Welcome to Straight Talk. This is our third episode. It's a show where the panellists are complete social conservatives without apology. And tonight we're going to discuss social issues that matter without constraint, without compromise, and of course, without a single dollar of government funding. Now, you can watch on our website, familyfirst.nz, and if you go there, you will see on the homepage, you just scroll down a little bit and you'll see the feed there. Or you can go to our YouTube channel, familyfirst.nz, we're uh, not .nz, just familyfirst.nz, or you can go to our Facebook page. And if you're on Facebook or if you're on YouTube, you can share your comments to the panel and submit any questions you may have, and I'll be happy to share those on. Now, our topics tonight include Winston Peters, is he back? And we analyse his recent State of the Nation speech. We talk about truancy and do kids need an education, the state of our mainstream media, and crime and punishment. That's all going to be within the next hour. So without further delay, it's a big welcome to the Brady Bunch, the most handsome Brady Bunch in New Zealand, the only one we could find actually. And I'm going to start at the bottom of the country and firstly in Christchurch, Bruce Logan. How are you, Bruce? Hardly the bottom, but nevertheless, I'm fine. <laughs> Okay, interesting choice of words, excellent. Uh, you're the only one in the South Island, actually, because then we come up to the North Island, and I was trying to figure out who is more north. Ashley's on the east, Christine's on the west. Who's more north? Yeah, the same. I think Ashley yeah, might be. Okay, well, we'll start nice. with age before beauty. Ashley, how are you? I'm good, mate, very good. <laughs> okay, and Christine, are you well in Taupo? Very well, thank you. Okay, and Ashley is in Esk Valley, and then we come up to the capital of New Zealand, uh, South Auckland, Ronji Tanielu. How are you, Ronji? So, Bob, my love, everyone. And finally, Hello. but not leastly, is Alfred Nardo, who's <coughs> actually back home with that beautiful decoration in the background. What is it, Alfred? Well, Mocha thought that I needed a bit of greenery. Because <clears throat> yeah. she said she looked around, she looked at um, you know Ashley's, she looked at <clears throat> how beautiful everyone else looked, and then what Christine had. So um, she said that you need some. So she just put some pot plants at the back. Lovely. And well, then she's uh, done a great Ashley job. said he thought I was in a, in a nightclub or something. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Now, before I unleash all of you with your free speech moment, we actually have breaking news from Parliament. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, but the Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, was asked at the post-Cabinet press conference this afternoon a very easy question. What is a woman? And I don't want to make out that I'm smarter than the Prime Minister, but the answer is really easy. Adult, human, female. I think most primary school children know the answer. Um, I think, and Alf Alfred, this is what you call in Parliament a patsy question. It's an easy question asked by your side with an easy answer, eh? What is a woman, adult, human, female? So this afternoon in the Beehive, our Prime Minister was asked this easy question, and let's see his rapid response. Palmer in Britain, how do you and how does this government define a woman? Um, <laughs> I, to be honest, Sean, that's, that, that question's come slightly out of left field for, for me. Um, the, well, biology, sex, gender, um, people define themselves, people define their own genders. Keir Starmer has said that he believes 99.9% .9 of women do not have penises. <coughs> I know it's a strange thing for him to say, but given recent events in New Zealand, I'd ask again, how do you define what a woman is? Well, as I've, I, I think as I've just indicated, I wasn't expecting that question, so it's not something that I've, um, you know, formulated, pre-formulated an answer on. But um, in terms of gender identity, I think people define their gender identity for themselves. Self-identification. Yes. <sighs> right. Well, there were some interesting words there. Um, I was trying to figure out who was laughing more during that particular excerpt. Bruce, I saw you just about fall off your chair. Have you got any words of advice for Chris Hipkins? Well, just be real. Stop hiding behind some kind of ill-gotten ideology that he's allowing to shape his thinking. Mm. Don't be so silly. Christine is the only uh, female on our panel at the moment. Could you help him out? I just think he was going through a thought process, how the hell am I going to get out of this question without getting into terrible trouble? And 
he couldn't. It didn't work. And he sort of settled into an answer that he thought might suit everyone, but it was a disaster, really. I almost yeah. felt sorry for him. Mm. Okay. Uh, Ronji, Ronji, I know you're very popular with the ladies. What do you reckon? <clears throat> As long as I'm popular with my wife, that's the only one that accounts for. That's uh, exact. That, that that was a test question, and Ben asked me to ask right. you to test. Uh, yeah, and she's looking at me now, and she says she'll punch <laughs> your face like I want to sometimes. So anyway, uh, look, to answer your question, I just thought that was that was horrible. I thought it was wokeism on steroids. It was political mm. correctness on steroids, and I thought it was sort of an example of what's wrong with New Zealand, but also what's wrong with our our leaders. I just thought there was no courage there to. To, to stand for what's true, what's clearly true. Mm. And it just seemed like our Prime Minister was more interested in trying to please everyone rather than standing to an objective standard yeah. of truth. Yeah, and I don't know if you realise that the reason that Sean Plunkett asked the question in the, in the Beehive Theatreette was because the leader of the opposition in the UK, the Labour Party, uh, he's, he's under advice that he should go slowly on the whole gender ID because he needs to take the country with him and the country is not with him. And I don't think the country's been with our government on this particular issue. Ashley, what was your response to what you saw? Well, firstly, I thought, the how did he phrase it? It's not something I've pre-formulated an answer on. I just mm. thought that was mm. stunning and telling. But mm. look, the thing for me, anybody who's watching this and anybody who saw that news item, this is the guy that I think the country at the moment, and you can see it in the polls, is thinking, mm. you know, he, maybe he's better, maybe he's not Jacinda, maybe this is a new take on things and he's getting rid of some of the unpopular old policies. And then you see mm. something like this, no, he's not. No, it's not. Okay. It's the same woke agenda that we've had for the last five years. It's no different. It's just as dangerous. He's just smarter about the way he's articulating it. OK. And Alfred, you've been a Minister of the Crown, so you would have been asked really tricky questions like this. What, what, what do you reckon about his response? I mean, that was kind of like a really pregnant pause, wasn't it? Well, I, I, actually, I was more interested in looking at the interpreter to responding to the second question from Sean Blokett uh, to see how she was going to interpret that question. Mm -hmm. Um, but look, I agree with what everyone's saying. I mean, the reality is he's, um, he's not, and we're not seeing it from any of our leaders, right? The ability to stand for what you believe in. How hard is that? We've got to a point where people are afraid to be cancelled. People are afraid to be who they are and to say it for what it is. He was almost there, Bob. He was almost there. And then he caught himself. And then out of fear, he actually <laughs> retracted and tried to create some PC wokeism that would be inclusive of everyone. Yeah, it must be exhausting to have to go through every question, sort of, even such an easy question like that. But, panel, this is the real question. I mean, I think I know what the Greens would say, and it wouldn't be based on biology, but how would Christopher Luxon and David Seymour answer this question? Um, and my challenge to the viewers is, if they get the chance, ask them, record their response, preferably on video, and send it to us. So your mission, should you decide to accept it, because I think they would struggle to answer it. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, Susan says that came out of left field, that questioner, apparently, with lots of smiling emojis. Um, Teresa said, should ask him what is a man? That might be slightly easier. Um, and June agrees that it's absolutely the same woke agenda, so you can comment. Right. Let's move on to uh, something which we do every week. It's the free speech moment. And panellists, because you've been so naughty over the last two episodes, I went to the $2 shop and I bought one of these. <laughs> and so this is going to go at 60 seconds and it's going to go at a minute 15. Okay, and then at a minute 30, I've instructed Gordon to just... <coughs> okay. So no pressure, no pressure at all. So um, we are going to start, as Bruce said, at the bottom. And uh, Bruce, your topic, is it still trans ideology? Oh, well, something like that. I can't okay. remember. You get to okay, well, stop. Remember. Okay, stop. <laughs> stop pinching uh, seconds. Your 90 seconds starts now. Well, the battle rises are at it again. They want to change ploughman's lunch to plough person's lunch. Androgyny is the name of the game. Now the Reverend Bowder and his wife were a well-meaning 19th century couple who thought there were some passages in Shakespeare that were too strong meat for children. So they went through and they took the offending bits out. For example, they dropped entirely the famous and fearful speech by Lady Macbeth. 
who, as her husband wrongly suspected, might be just too full of the milk of human kindness. And I quote a bit of her speech, and she says, she's praying, by the way, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me now, and fill me from the crown to the top of my full of direct cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the excess and passage to remorse, that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Well, at least Mady Macbeth was selling her soul to the devil like a female Faustus, was only praying that dreadful pagan prayer for herself. She didn't want the whole world unsexed and gendered like the 21st century trans-intoxicated, self-creating worshippers do, who would encourage young girls confused about their sexual identity to bind the maturing adolescent breasts and even to cut them off in order to fulfill the cultist's perverse fantasy of self-creation. Indeed, they would even stop up the excess and passage to remorse and allow no compunctious <coughs> visitings of nature to reveal the dreadful error. And just to reinforce that folly, New Zealand has recently passed a law, the Conversion Practices Prohibition Legislation Act, which would make sure those compunctious physics of nature are cast into outer darkness. They would unsex us all. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. I'm just trying to see my Roger the Saurus on the shelf um, because I, I just want to remind everybody that this is G-rated, but there was a very important point and Spirit. hey 90 Spirit. seconds free speech so you know we're not going to interrupt the good news was that we didn't have a clock to count you down so well done you got no, away I, with I blue murder then I, that's what put me right off no clock. yeah no you got away with blue murder never mind okay ashley um now you want to talk about turning back the tide on woke lunacy your 90 seconds starts now yeah, thanks, Bob. Last week we talked about Posey Parker and the change that her visit to New Zealand brought about without anyone even saying a word. We reflected on the fact that the violent actions of the counter-protesters to her Hyde Park address turned an event that might have reached a few hundred people into a rallying call for tens of thousands. Kiwis, who up until that point had been too scared to voice a view, at least they find themselves ostracised, suddenly found that their views were shared by the overwhelming majority of people in this country. On every social media platform, the tide of opinion has turned, with Kiwis reacting strongly to the thuggery of the counter-protest. They've also realised that it's okay to express traditional conservative views and that doing so isn't a one-way ticket to oblivion. The single biggest trick of the woke movement, convincing us all that we were alone in our views, has been broken. But here's the thing, we have to keep speaking out. And not just against the trans agenda and its attack on the hard-fought rights of women, but against any view that seeks to subvert the traditional values on which this nation was built. That's not to say that we should be rude or disrespectful. People with views different to our own are entitled to pursue lifestyles that we might not be comfortable with, and the consequences of those lifestyles are ultimately between them and their creator. Instead, our role is to continue to stand strong in the values that we hold, living by them, defending them, and sharing them openly and fearlessly on the platforms that are available to us while respecting the rights of others to share counter views, however repugnant we might find those views. Speak up and keep speaking up, but do it respectfully, to do anything else is to make us indistinguishable from the screaming and violent mob who characterised the woke movement. Fantastic. Uh, that was perfect. In fact, I was so engrossed by what you were saying, I missed the uh, one-minute bell. So well done. Uh, Christine, uh, and you are wanting to talk about Te Whata Ora. Your six, 90 seconds starts now. I just wonder if New Zealand understands the terrible, terrible state of our health system. The new system is a disaster and it's about to tip over. I've been on health boards for something like 16 years. I mean, they no longer exist and I don't believe New Zealanders also understood that they were going to have no representation from their communities on health boards. But they are ready to tip over and we are headed into winter. And the media just won't talk about it. They have little items every now and again that doesn't tell us anywhere near the seriousness of it. Do you know there are people at 70 who are being told they can't have chemotherapy. They're too old. They're not going to be able to cope with it. What a lot of rot. That is to save money. Do you know you can't get a hip replacement unless you're in a wheelchair? And they won't even put you on the list. So they'll tell you that the list is actually quite contained and we've only got this number of people on it. You're not allowed it until on it on it until you are in a hell of a state. 
we need to be scared. As winter approaches, we need to be very, very afraid. And no one's asking the right questions. It terrifies me. There we go. You didn't even take up your whole time. Well done. Thank you, Christine. No, I- I'm scared of you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all are. Um, right, uh, let's come up to the capital of New Zealand, uh, South Auckland, and Ronji Tanielu wants to remind us that it is Passover and Easter coming up. Your 90 seconds starts yeah, hey, now. Amy. Yeah, cool. Well, I just wanted to wish everyone a wonderful um, a Passover or Easter period. Uh, I have been talking about uh, coming from an unashamedly Christian and biblical worldview, uh, and that's what frames my social and moral conservatism. I know that there's a lot of people that are looking forward to the rest this weekend, uh, to the long weekend, to the hot cross buns, the Easter eggs, and so on. But I just wanted to say that this uh, is the celebration of the high point of the Christian calendar. And I, and I just want to read a verse from John chapter 1, verse 29. Uh, and John the Baptist says this, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That word behold means to have a look. He's shouting out to say, please look at this message. And he uses the imagery of the Lamb of God, referring back to the Pascal uh, la, uh, or Passover lamb from uh, Exodus and Leviticus. And he describes the fact that this is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. This is the high point for the Christian calendar as we celebrate and remember the death, the burial and the resurrection of our Messiah. And I just wanted to wish everyone a blessed Easter or Passover period. But I pray that we would all consider the real reason of why we uh, have this time for Passover or Easter. My Lord, love Thank you, Ronji. And uh, I was actually a little bit scared about ringing the bell because I just wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. So uh, well done. Thank you for uh, that. Uh, now, finally, Alfred, and you want to speak on She'll Be Right. Is this another one that your wife has written for you? No, no, this is all me, Bob. Okay, 90 seconds starts now. <clears throat> Yeah, look, I'm, I've been uh, traveling around the South Island in particular, uh, big cities, small towns. And uh, <clears throat> as I've been going and listening and talking with people, you know, there's a lot of people that are really unhappy in this country. That's nothing new. Unhappy with the, the government, unhappy with education, unhappy with, uh, I've listened to farmers talk about three waters and talk about the challenges of, and all the overwhelming regulations that have been imposed. I've heard our parents talk about education and what they see is the imposing nature of minority views upon their children and their teachers. And I've heard people talk about the health system and the very things that Christine's talk about is a reality for many of them. And I remember stopping for a moment and and people said to me, well, what do you think? And I said, look, firstly, I agree with you. I agree with many of the sentiments of the concern, but I want us to step back for a minute and ask the question, how did we get here? This didn't just happen overnight. We are in the demise that we are as a country because for such a long time, We've used that old Kiwi colloquialism, that idiom, that she'll be right. She'll be right actually means that um, it'll take care of itself. We don't have to worry about doing anything. And we've allowed the values, the moral values that we've upheld as a country to slowly slip away. And that's the reason why we are where we are right now. My challenge to everyone out there, let's stop saying she'll be right. We have to make it right. We have to stand up. We have to speak out for all the things that we believe are important, the values for our family, for our country, and for our people. Fantastic. Thank you, Alfred. And I uh, didn't give you the warning bell because I knew you were wrapping up. I could just tell. Well done. Now, well done to all the panel. You've done a fantastic job, all pretty well within the time frame. So we are improving that area, although I noticed that uh, there was one comment here uh, from, uh, now, who was it? It was, uh, did that come through? There it is, Martin. Martin said that Ashley is upping the word count. We uh, thought that you were going pretty fast there, Ashley, and I think you might have had gusts of up to about 180 words a minute. Anyway, let's move on and to our first topic. And as we lead up to the election in October, we'll be discussing policies of the parties as they're released, the latest polling, and also we'll be analysing the leaders and key speeches as they make them. And last week, we talked about National's childcare policy, and this week, it's the former Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters who is eyeing a political comeback after being knocked out of Parliament at the last election in 2020. Now, Winston Peters gave his State of the Nation address at a church in Howick just over a week ago, attended by about 200 people. Interesting that he chose to do it in a church, because I'm sure we all remember those images of Judith Collins praying in a church before the last election and the media response. But what I want to do is, um, I mean, he covered a number of topics, but there was 
uh, a few statements that might bring music to some of our audience's ears, and then I'd like to hear the panellists' uh, responses. So uh, let's just watch a couple of short clips. Um, so this first one is where, Ashley, Ashley, I think you would really appreciate what he has to say here. Winston makes some comments about community. Let's have a watch. You see, the mass majority of New Zealanders are, and don't rush and complain about this statement, but it's about humanity. The mass majority of New Zealanders are conservatives with a sense of humanity. We believe in giving our neighbours a helping hand when that neighbour's in trouble. We want our hard-earned taxes spent on those issues which, as a mass majority, we believe in. Now, during Cyclone Gabriel, despite bureaucratic failure everywhere, we saw so many people working together to address the crisis right there, right now. They put aside their differences and focused instead on their shared humanity and shared gold, with many putting their lives at risk as well. And today's politicians must surely learn from that exercise and that example. Okay, so some good statements about uh, community. And then he talked about education versus indoctrination. Well, our system of education has been the victim of numerous virtue signaling tinkerers who have never been challenged. And they would now rather teach a young child virtuous self-identity theory, <laughs> whatever that might mean, than basic maths and English. Our education system should be fundamentally focused on education, not using our children in some sort of woke social re-engineering program for vulnerable, underdeveloped minds. And here's the point. And when were they allowed to decide that parents' views don't matter? Good question. Uh, now, don't adjust your video because actually that's the video that we were provided that's blinkering. So um, as long as you can hear the audio. Uh, Ashley, I'd like to come to you first because um, Winston's opening comments, I actually thought maybe he listened to your uh, free speech moment a couple of weeks ago when you talked about the exact same thing. Bob, I don't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. If I had my way, he would never be allowed back into the political realm again. This is the guy. This is the guy that put us in the position that we're in now. And did he, he didn't do it for, for reasons of principle. He didn't do it for reasons that were to do with anything that was in the interest of the country. He is consumed by Utu and revenge. His entire 40-year career has been about getting revenge on people. And 2017 was no different. It was a particular stage in his career where he had, where he had a snitch on a couple of national MPs, and that's why he didn't go into coalition with them. I thought the country actually understood this and understood never again should be a mantra when it comes to Winston. But, oh, no. Here we go again, he says a few nice things and we fall back under the spell and we go into another situation where he's a, he's a necessary coalition partner for, from some poor sucker of a party that actually has to deal with them. Never, ever again. Okay, Ronji, do you agree with that? Hey, look, I really like Winston. He's a little bit like Rocky because he keeps making comebacks. So I like Winston. Too. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if he's a social conservative as, as such, but he's a really clever operator because he's saying the things that people are thinking about, that people are too scared to say themselves. They're polling at about 3% in a couple of different polls, so uh, they're getting close to that threshold. And look, I hear what um, what Ashley has said, but I like him. I think he makes politics interesting. Uh, he is out there for his own gain, but at the same time, uh, he is he's, he's clever. He's, he's saying things that people are thinking about and worried about and concerned about around the country. And so, look, don't be surprised if he makes it in, uh, in October. Okay, Bruce, that would have been music to your ears, wouldn't it, though, about the whole uh, education versus indoctrination? I mean, he hit the button on the nail on the head, didn't he? Oh, yes. He, 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 knows, he knows who to speak to, he knows his audience, and he knows what to say to the audience that's there in front of him. He might be a bit slippery, though, he's, but he's a consummate politician. And I, and I think he's got a sense of humour, which is not a, a common feature of a lot of politicians. I think um, Chris Hipkins could have done with one this evening. Okay, um, Christine. He's the, oh, no, go on, sorry. go on, Bruce. I cut you off. It, but he is the closest party leader we've got to a social conservative. I think that's pretty evident. 
and he's the only um, a member of parliament I've ever heard talk intelligently about that great conservative Edmund Burke. So that endeared him a bit with me. But I understand Ashley's point of view, I understand what he's saying. Hmm. I think he might have been a bit tough on him, but nevertheless, whether we can trust him, well, I don't really know. But certainly what he says is useful and helpful, and I wish other members of parliament and other party leaders would say that, especially from the National Party, for example. Okay, I Christine, really is like he a be... true conservative? Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? <laughs> Look, I, I agree actually with what everyone said. I mean, Winston is dangerous in that he can split the vote, he can take away votes from parties that really will make things happen, and I don't trust him. But you know what? He is the only one at the moment who's reflecting the feelings and thoughts of a huge number of New Zealanders because the others are too scared to do it. And when you don't trust the others, I mean, we shouldn't be trusting him either, but when you don't trust the others, he's a very tempting vote taker. And that is really dangerous because look what he's done to us. He caused the situation we're in at the moment. And I absolutely agree with Ashley on that. But he's going to make his mark if he keeps this up and nobody comes to match him. And they're sure as hell not at the moment. OK, I've got uh, two other clips that I want to show you. But Alfred, just um, do you have a quick comment to make about what we've heard so far? Yeah, look, I mean, the thing is, is that voting is a motive. That's the reality. I mean, we can try to make it all intelligent, but people vote on their emotions. And Winston knows how to play to those emotions. Whether you trust them or not, the reality is it's not about us. But if you look at the, the picture of the people in the video, they're all his base. And in the absence of having strong, conservative uh, voices speaking out, he's filling the void. And so people are listening. They're wanting other people to speak out. And unless someone else speaks out, then he'll, he'll fill that space. And then the reality is they'll vote for him. Okay, uh, let's just check some uh, comments. And uh, Princess Adora says, I'd rather Winston than National or Labour. However, uh, Mihi says, no way. Uh, Casey says, well, what he said was the truth. I hope New Zealand wakes up and stands up the child ed to child education. Is there a ticket out of poverty and crime? Um, Gigi Allen says, remember people when it comes to politicians, forget what they say, watch what they do. Uh, which is a very good one, and yeah, okay. Now, let me show you two more clips, because I'm interested to get your comments on this. Uh, the first clip is where he talks about all the changing of names of government departments to the Māori words. Let's check this clip out. There's a full-scale attack being waged on New Zealanders' culture, identity, and sense of belonging. And the only way they can achieve this is by attacking the bonds that used to hold our society together and to misrepresent the facts behind our shared history. This elite self-appointed, self-opinionated have as their purpose the destruction of our cultural inheritance. They want to totally overhaul our system of government and values by a political fait accompli, by releasing an army of Pandoras from their box of tricks on the simple basis it's out now, and you won't be able to put it back. That's what they're saying. Well, that depends what you think. All right, let's uh, leave that one, and just one more clip before I get your final comments. Uh, and he talks about what I thought was really uh, hitting the nail on the head. It was about the culture war. Have a listen to these comments. This crisis in health must be addressed in Budget 2023, starting with a name for the health service that 95% of New Zealanders can understand. <laughs> Not Te Fatu Ora. <laughs> Everybody knows that language and communication is about understanding. But these people don't care. They've got Waka Kotai heading down the road. They're going to be out in the water. Get on Air New Zealand. They've got the Waka in the sky. Why are we putting up with this bull dust? It's your country. Take it back. All right, let's uh, leave it there. Ashley, you're going to vote for him now? <laughs> no. <laughs> and and, and let, me, let me pick up on the language thing. And this is where sometimes I wonder if I'm a conservative. Because what, what's the problem with using Māori language in, in some stuff? Look, if you, as, as long as you've got the option and people can choose what they like, 
who cares whether it's in Māori or it's in English? If people, uh, this, this obsession that part of the, the, uh, the conservative base of New Zealand have with instead of focusing on real issues that actually matter and are actually affecting this country and its, and its moral base, are worried about whether the country's called Aotearoa or New Zealand. Who cares? Who cares? And if that's what's going to get him votes, if Winston's going to win votes by tapping into that, then I'm in the wrong country. Christine, you agree with that? Yeah, I've got no problem with sharing the language at all. But I'll tell you what, he's going to get thousands and thousands yeah. and thousands of votes from that because people are afraid. And this is one of the things they're afraid of that they're not allowed to talk about unless we have open debate in New Zealand because it isn't just sharing a language. There are things that have been presented and things that have been hidden that people are terrified of. And so Winston is addressing it in a way people will relate to. So of course they're going to vote for him. That is the most powerful thing he's talked about when you Alfred? look at the fear in the community. Okay. Alfred, what do you reckon? Yeah, so this is where I'm, I separate from um, my views on Winston in regards to the fact that what he's doing is that he's just dividing a nation. This is the stuff that, this is the red meat he used to throw out to his base. Look, if you can remember, if people have long memories, unfortunately, sometimes we don't. He started talking, doing away with uh, Māori seats. Do you remember that? He talked about, and everyone loved that. He started talking about the Treaty of Waitangi. We're going to remove that from, uh, constitutionally from different parts of our legislation and so forth. When he got into the seat of power, he couldn't do it. And he knew that. But he made these promises, and people have forgotten about that. What he's doing, actually, I disagree. He's dividing a nation again. We've already had a leader uh, who came in and has already divided a nation through mandating. This is the same thing again. And I think people need to be very concerned because it's not conservatism now. That's not traditional values. The traditional values are exactly what Christine and Ashley have said. This is now politicking in the worst kind. Okay. Ronji? Yeah, no, no, nothing really extra to add. I think those are really good thoughts. I guess what I'm, what I, when watching those clips, like you just see how sharp an operator that he is, and he's he's really, very really clever. I've actually talked to a couple of Maori groups around the country who themselves are unhappy about uh, the naming of government departments without proper consultation and all that kind of stuff. So the whole thing is a minefield. The whole thing is messy. But I think the whole thing is a little bit of a distraction as well. We need to get stuck into those real key issues. I think that other speakers have said today and. Uh, again, he is such a sharp operator. He is very smooth. And so as much as I think he makes politics fun, um, I, can, I can hear and agree uh, with the worry and concern about his politicking and us needing to be a little bit cautious about uh, him in the, next, in the coming election. Yeah, and I think that's the issue, Bruce, isn't it? In the same way that the Labour Party in the UK are warning the leader not to push this trans ID issue without taking the country with them, it seems like the government has not taken the country down this journey of acknowledging Māori as an official language of New Zealand. Do you agree with that? Yes. Language change comes about from the bottom up. Around the, if you wanted, language change happens naturally, and if there's a movement to use more Māori phrase, phraseology or words and so on in the culture, and that's coming from the people, that's a good thing. But at the moment, it seems to be that it's being imposed on us for ideological reasons and that is something that gets up my nose somewhat I'm I'm not it's not that I'm unhappy about the use of the words but I'm unhappy about the way they are being imposed on us without agreement really and it feels as though that we're being forced into a kind of almost a kind of new way of thinking about the world that is that I think is quite unnecessary. I would. I haven't got time to talk about the in, in um, imposition of a civil religion now, but that's the direction we're moving in. Okay, that can be your free speech moment for next week. Uh, let's just check the comments. Uh, Stephen says Winston is one hundred percent right about the language. English is our universal language. Uh, it's the language of trade, and as he says, the majority understands it. Your panel is wrong on this. Hope you saw that panel. Uh, John says, to be honest, I don't think any of the parties are ideal for this country. They never address morality. Kiwi Gal says, Winston is the only one opposing the madness. All political parties in New Zealand are in lockstep. Lock uh, Te Taha says, vote no confidence. If everyone did that, they would have to change the whole system. Uh, no, I don't think that would happen. Um, and Wally says, 
Winston put Labour in in 2017, but what kept them in was the pandemic and voters that love Jacinda Ardern. And Eyes Up says, side issues will only divide, we gain nothing. So uh, very good points. Right, let's move on to the uh, next topic. Uh, do our kids need an education? Uh, now, truancy, less than half, 46% of students are attending school regularly at the moment, compared to 60% in 2019. And only a third of Māori and Pacific students are attending regularly. 22% are attending fewer than 70% of the time. In other words, that's some major wagging. Now, or absence, whether it's justified or not. Now, let me just show you two graphs. Firstly, uh, this is the uh, school attendance by decile. And so decile one is the poorer areas, the lower socioeconomic areas. And you can see that the attendance, so blue is 2019, uh, orange is 2020. So this is even before the pandemic. Very low school attendance by decile, especially in low socio socioeconomic areas. And you'll see that it improves as the deciles go up. But look at that dramatic drop in 2021 and 2022. And that's post pandemic. So things are not too good. But let's also have a look at this next graph. Um, and this is on the left is regular attendance. So that's more than 90%. Now you'll see there that even in 2019, it was still only 59.7. Uh, and now it has dropped right down. And then if you go out the right-hand side, you'll see chronic absences has gone up to 12.9. Now, here's the interesting thing before I get the panel to comment on this. An ER, ERO report last year said that regular attendance means attending more than 90% of the time. In New Zealand, it fell from 70% in 2015 to just 58% in 2019. That's before covid 58%. In Australia, the comparative figure was 73%. And it's above 80% in the UK, Ireland, US, and parts of Canada. And remember, that's more than 80, we were 58%. Now, just before the panel comment, I just want to show you this clip where the Minister of Education, Jan Tanetti, uh, and she's the minister who shepherded through the birth certificates legislation, which says you can change your sex on the birth certificate to whatever you think your sex is, so biology is not her forte, but she's now the Minister of Education. And she was asked about truancy rates, and it didn't go too well. Have a watch. Unjustified absences increasing. <coughs> Unjustified absences are, have been on the increase over COVID because, um, well, actually, no. Can I start that again? Take two. Unjustifieds are coming down since 2019. Hang on, but official data very much shows unjustified absences are increasing. They made up 3.5% of half days taken without a valid excuse in Term 1, 2019, and 6.5% of half days in Term 3, 2022. News Hub showed this very graph to the Minister. You can't compare between terms. You have to, each term is very separate. Righto, so let's take a look at Term 3 data. In Term 3, 2019, 5% of half days were unjustified absences and then in 2022 those absences were up to 6.5 percent. You accept that the overall trend line is increasing? No. No you don't? No because you have to look at each term separately. The minister's preferred data is this which shows even though absences overall are increasing the proportion of unjustified absences shown here in purple are decreasing. Look, the Minister is desperately clutching at straws in this instance. What she needs to focus on is a solution. And I almost need a whiteboard to explain it to you because it is so complicated. OK, so uh, look, Bruce, we might come to you first because you've been involved in the education sector for many years. So um, I guess, firstly, what's your response to what you just heard and how do we solve the problem of high rates of truancy? Well, of course, truancy is a problem and an increasing problem. And it's a social issue and it's a consequence of a whole range of factors. But we have lost our confidence in ourselves as a nation. It's not just confined to New Zealand, of course, but we're seeing we're talking about New Zealand, we'll stick with it. Um, and the education system reflects that loss of confidence. And with the loss of confidence comes a, a lack of respect for authority. And with that lack of respect for authority, there's not the same enthusiasm for going to school. 
and the kind of relationship between parents and children isn't there in the way we used to once upon a time have it. So Bruce, do you think it's the parents at fault or it's the children just aren't motivated to go or is it both? No, he's frozen and he's gone. Okay, we'll come to you, Christine. What do you think? Look, I don't know what the solution is. I'm horrified by the problem and I'm even more horrified by the minister. That was just embarrassing and awful. I do have to say, Erica Stanford is a standout and she's a future prime minister and I trust her, but I still haven't heard anyone come up with what the solution is. And I can't really offer anything because I don't know what it is. I think, yes, it's the parents, and yes, it's a change in the way kids see the world and what they're expected to do, and something in schools isn't capturing them either. I don't know. It's a horrifying situation for our country, and I can't add anything of any worth, Bob. I'm sorry. I just don't get it, and I don't know how to fix it. Do you think parents are feeling disempowered, though? Do you think that they tell their kids to go to school and their kids tell them to get stuffed? Absolutely. Parents, as we full well know, have been disempowered since the smacking legislation came in. And teachers are disempowered as well. It's a nightmare. OK. Uh, Alfred, you have been both a social worker on the ground and you've also been in the halls of power in Parliament. What do you think the solution is? Yeah, so first of all, um, <clears throat> what it isn't is trying to create um, what you call counting and measuring outputs uh, so what the Minister Jan Tanetti has done, she's tried to say that if we can sort of look at the measure of the outputs, in other words, increase uh, attendance. Um, and so what she's done, she's announced she's putting $74 million into attendance services. So basically, as long as they can show they're getting kids bums on seats at schools, it's going to make it look better. That is not going to solve anything. It goes back to the simple thing, and Bruce and Christine have touched on it. Number one, it's about the family. It's about the home. And we've taken away um, the ability for families to be families, to look after their kids. We've started surrogating roles. Look, uh, lunch in schools, breakfast in schools, it all sounds really good. We've got kids doing it hard. But instead of actually getting and working with the families, we've started saying, OK, schools, you can take a part, uh, take a part in doing that. Our embassy system, and I can remember because I was the Associate Minister for Oranga Tamariki, and while we're trying to do good things, we keep surrogating. So the primary, and Christine will know this, the primary focus is the child, not the family. And so if, you're, if your paramountcy is the child, you've now got the family as a surrogate role of responsibility. So um, is, there a, is there a solution? Absolutely. We have to have people who understand the system, understand actually it's about shifting things that allow families to be families, to take responsibility. Everyone wants to talk about rights, but we're not talking about responsibilities. The last thing I want to say, I remember being at school and a lot of kids and a lot of people were talking about some of the challenges there. And I remember one child who was 12 years old stood up in that meeting and said, everyone wants to talk about rights. Can we also talk about responsibilities? We need to sort of refocus the system on caring for families to do what they do best. Okay, Ashley, you got the final word on this one? Yeah, well, Ronji hasn't spoken yet, but, uh, but oh, yeah, sorry. so, so my, right. think, that's right. so my <laughs> thinking on this is, is firstly, that we, we, we need to be a, a, a little bit um, retrospective in remembering this isn't completely new. I mean, I was at school, at high school in the late 70s and early 80s, and I used to wag at uh, midday so I could go off and watch the soaps, and to the extent that I got to, I think, August, and they said, if you take one more half day, you can't do school search. So, I mean, I was one of those statistics back in the day, so this isn't a new thing. <laughs> sorry, Having said that... If, I know it's terrible. I'm sorry, Christine. But if you fast forward to you fast forward to now, I mean, schools aren't prisons. Schools are places where we want kids to learn. And and I think part of the issue, there's plenty of blame to go around in this, but part of the issue for me is is the stuff that we're actually trying to ram down kids' throats. I mean, we've got the self learning, self directed learning agenda that basically says to kids, you tell us what you want to be taught. Um, and then to the extent that we are teaching, it's the sort of social engineering stuff that we're doing. Maybe if we actually examined what we're doing and dealt with those other stuff that, that, that the, the other stuff that Alfred and Christine and, and, and Bruce have talked about around parent responsibility and all that stuff, I think there's a mixture of stuff. The impression I do get though, is that Labor's given up on this. I think they've looked at it, they've realised they can't fix it. I think they probably recognise that they're in, the, in for a hiding at the end of this year and they've given up on this and they're focusing on what little they can do in other areas. Okay, Ron G, I didn't forget you. Um, got a solution? Yeah, a couple of quick comments. I think firstly that 
interview was a train wreck because it sounded like Minister Tanedi had been advising Minister Hipkin or Prime Minister Hipkin, so that was a whole train wreck. <laughs> um, I guess the two, two solutions I just wanted to offer because we've talked about the social issues, they're really well proven. It's to toxicity at home, maybe it's around curriculum, the family um, unit, all those things. I think those are well documented. I think one thing we might need to look at is the role of charter schools. Or, or special partnership schools. I think that's worked really well, especially in poorer communities yes. around the world. I actually oppose charter schools when ACT brought them out several years ago. As I've been looking at the research, they've worked well. It's around school choice, being able to provide new pathways, alternative pathway, pathways of learning that actually engage kids. And the second um, solution that I've been thinking about is around homeschooling. And I know the homeschooling numbers are still really low, but I actually had a look at the homeschooling numbers from 2015 to 2022 they've actually increased by nearly 100%. Yep. And between 2021 and 2022, in one year, mm -hmm. the number of Māori and Pacific kids in homeschooling increased by over 60%. That's mm -hmm. a massive shift. And so I guess those are kind of, again, I always rage at um, social and moral conservatives. We always rage at the problem. We always go, oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. What are the solutions? So I think we need to look at charter schools and maybe look at how do we resource a better homeschooling options for families. Okay, well done. Let's just uh, check some of the comments. Uh, and firstly, from Dennis, stability in the home is missing and our children don't respect authority of parents or police and the politicians uh, add more confusion. Um, also, uh, June, I think, has her tongue in her cheek. She says the absences surely support the teacher shortage and take the burden off overworked schools. And there may be uh, some truth to that as well. Uh, Carol says you just have to look at what they are teaching our kids. It is not education, it is indoctrination. Uh, Leo says I ran a program at school for truanting in primary school. It was really successful but I had kept saying include the parents, support the parents, support the community and give them the help they need to encourage and inspire their children. Uh, so some very good comments from that. Right, before we go on to our next topic, we have a very important and quick message from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Walt Heyer. I'm looking forward to coming to New Zealand and talking about the issues around transgenderism because I lived a life. In fact, I started cross-dressing myself as a four-year-old boy, and we need to know more about how to protect our children from going through these awful hormone procedures that are totally unnecessary in the surgeries that destroy their life because all we're doing is devaluing, dehumanizing and destroying young people's lives and that must stop. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's Lila Rose with Live Action and I'm so excited to get to speak to you at Forum on the Family coming up in June. We're gonna talk about the importance of fighting for life, whether it's in New Zealand or here in the United States, and how together, if we are convicted and passionate and willing to stand up for the truth and stand up for the preborn child and their parents, we can change our countries and our culture. Excited to see you there. I'm Kevin Sabet. I'm the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana and also the Foundation for Drug Policy Solutions. I'm super excited to come down to Auckland in June for the Family Forum. and. I am a former three-time White House drug policy advisor, most recently in the Obama administration, where I led efforts on the drug policy strategy and also with regards to cannabis and marijuana use. And, you know, it's very important people understand that we're not talking about the marijuana of old. We're talking about a massive new industry uh, that really wants to addict our kids and is only looking to profit. And that's what I worry about with regards to efforts to commercialize and legalize cannabis globally. Okay, so that looks like a fantastic conference, which everyone needs to be at. So uh, go to forumonthefamily.nz. Uh, and one of our guest speakers uh, is the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, John Anderson, who's speaking at our gala dinner on the Thursday night. So forumonthefamily.nz. Uh, thanks to our sponsors. Right, next topic, a new report commissioned by Family First reviewed the media coverage of one of the most significant events last year, the parliamentary protest, which lasted almost four weeks. Uh, and what it finds is that basically the media failed to present the protest in a fair and balanced way. Now, the report painstakingly looked at 600 articles in the mainstream media over a 22-day period, which is an average of 27 uh, per day. Uh, but unfortunately, the unbalanced reporting was also evident, as we heard in the cannabis referendum and the conversion therapy and the abortion debate around Roe v. Wade. But here's what the analysis of the 600 articles actually found. Firstly, 
72% of media coverage made no attempt at all to report the concerns, and many of those articles which did mention their concerns reported them alongside critical commentary, <coughs> and around 20 stories, just 3% of the total, almost 600 reviewed, featured quotes from protesters. Now, many of them were happy to be named, so they weren't hiding from the media, but there were only a couple of stories that profiled protesters in any <coughs> depth, and the coverage tended to focus on the more controversial and possibly fringe elements of the groups, as often the media do, and it's not hard to find those extremities like we saw with the Posey Parker protesting. Now, and, and what they found was that most of the protesters were opposed to the mandates and concerns around children being vaccinated, the loss of jobs. But just before the panel comment, here's the really interesting aspect. They did research, the courier market research, where they actually went around the protesters and took a sample and asked them why they were there. It was commissioned by the platform. And what it found was this. Polling showed a disproportionate number of Māori. So that destroys the white supremacist narrative which has been pushed in the media. Um, but it also showed, believe it or not, folks, significant representation from Labour and Green supporters. Uh, there it is there. And so that sort of destroys the right-wing narrative also pushed in the media. Can we show that uh, ethnic breakdown as well, Gordon? So there's the ethnic breakdown, and uh, you can see there large um, representation of Māori, which, of course, we were told that it was white supremacists. So to the panellists, does this report surprise you, but were the media right to treat the protest with contempt? Uh, Ashley, let's start with you. So firstly, um, well done to Family First for doing this. So having said that, I don't know that it was necessarily uh, necessary because I think we all knew just by watching it that there was, a, there was a degree of bias. I would make one comment though, and it's kind of an echo of what I said in that previous item, and that is that um, media bias isn't a new thing. We shouldn't, th we shouldn't try and kid ourselves that this is a new thing. Media bias has always been there. It's, it's just that in the past, it was probably more in line with our thinking um, because, because society was different. So as society changes, the media bias changes more toward where that, where, where that change takes place. What I would say, though, is I don't buy into the idea that with the exception of stuff, and the exception of Radio New Zealand, which have clearly got an agenda and which have clearly got an editorial policy, I don't think most of the rest of the media are actually necessarily saying to their various reporters, hey, you have to report in a particular way. I think it's more reflection, and I remember that you guys did another report a little while back, Bob, that supported this. It's more reflection of the fact that there is an increasing left-wing bias in the media itself in terms of the young journos that are actually uh, getting these roles. So what I think is happening is, is that as people are getting younger in these roles, they're bringing with them those views that's but that's that's impacting the way that they're reporting and that's that's kind of shaping what we're seeing but i would make in defense of for example an organization like nz me um, for every lefty you've got in that organization you've got a hoskins you've got a heather de plusy allen uh, you know you've you, you've got some pretty strong uh, conservative and, and, and moral commentators as well so i'm not quite sure it's as big an issue as we necessarily think it is but the trend is definitely in the wrong direction okay ronji do you agree with that you're concerned about this Yeah, I am actually. Look, I've, I've lost a lot of faith in terms of legacy or mainstream media, to be honest, and I don't pay it much attention. Uh, and I think that's probably why you've seen other platforms like the platform or what's the new group, Reality Check Media, come out. And I think uh, that's probably showing that as, there's a lot of people <clears throat> that have lost trust in, in legacy or mainstream media, but there's a gap there in terms of those that want to, that are more socially and morally conservative, and they don't know where to get their news from. And so I think I've asked a couple of times in this show, are there any really rich people that are willing to be able to provide some some greater funding around getting an alternative uh, voice or or, or, or or set of voices out there in terms of providing news that is different to what the narrative is? I guess I wasn't, wasn't surprised by the whole thing. The whole thing was a mess. And I think one of the things that I found really sad was that the politicians actually didn't come out to meet with, uh, with yeah. the protesters. And I thought that if... Uh, Luxon and the, the opposition had come out and actually stood with them and, and, and listened to, they were just Kiwis that had a view, right? They were just Kiwis that had a, that had a real passionate view. I think if they had come out and actually heard uh, what the people were saying, I think probably National would be way ahead of the polls right now. So I think it was just bad politics and I have no trust in leg legacy media and I hope there's other alternatives that come out in the future.
Well, there was one uh, key political leader that did come out, and uh, that was Ashley's friend, Winston Peters. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Alfred, what, <laughs> Alfred, what, what, Alfred, what do you reckon? Oh, look, I, I, I totally agree with Ronji. I mean, look, I, I contacted a couple of my friends that are still in there, and I said to them, this is ridiculous. I said, if it was the other way around, if National was the government, Labour were the opposition, and if National said, come on, let's stand in solidarity, let's not go out and visit these this river of filth, as, as they put it, mm -hmm. um, Labour would have turned around, get, get, said, get stuff, given us the fingers, gone outside, pitched the tent, and started throwing stones. What happened to the National Party that always stood that every New Zealander deserves to be heard? Parliament is the people's place. It's called the House of Representatives, and they had totally forgotten all about that. And instead, again, they bought into... The, they, they drunk the Kool-Aid. They turn around. As far as the media is concerned, look, that's nothing new. When I was the Minister of Pacific Peoples, I remember that we gave out something like 30 scholarships to bright Pacifica students. Some of them were, were head boys and girls of some of the mainstream schools. Do you think we could get mainstream media there? Absolutely not. On that same night in South Auckland at the Whale Samoa in Mangere, then there was uh, some event that happened down the road and it was all over the media. And what did they say? Young Polynesian youth doing some things, doing crime and so forth. It really annoyed me because, again, here's the media. They want to sensationalize things that go wrong. When we talk about that we want to celebrate these wonderful things, they don't want to have a bar of it. So to be honest, I don't have time to actually have people make excuses because here's the thing that I want to say. We've allowed good intentions to excuse bad behavior. I would say this, that's over. We, don't, we should not tolerate that. And people that turn around and say, oh, you know, but I'm trying to do good, not good enough. And because of that, our people have suffered, our community suffered, and now our country suffered because of people who turn around and say, I'm trying to do the best. Well, I've got to tell you, good intentions are now not enough for excusing your bad behaviour. Okay, and just finally, Christine, um, did we receive the real reason that protest happened and the justification for it? Never. And you know, what that proved to me is, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about democracy's changed and it's no longer what people fought and died for. And everybody in this country has a right to believe what they want to believe and to protest if they want to protest. The way that that whole thing was constructed, it was the media and government um, joining together to ostracise anyone who wouldn't be part of the whole and it was appalling the way those people were treated was absolutely embarrassing and appalling and look it didn't just happen here it happened across the world but when i look back on it there are people who've been pushed out doctors who only ask questions who no longer practice as they used to that's a dreadful state for us to be in okay and ronji you saw bethlehem college pushing back um, with success didn't you yeah, and I guess I just wanted to highlight that part. I mean, I, I have very little trust in legacy mainstream media, but I love it when uh, different groups, we've seen Bethlehem College push back and, and really push back in terms of some of that really biased uh, reporting. So I think those media hit jobs for conservatives and for Christians will continue. I think we should push back, stand against some of this stuff, push back with wisdom, push back with strength, push back with truth. Okay, we've got about uh, six minutes left. We're just going to go slightly over time because I just want to do this last topic. Stats NZ released sentencing data for last year. Uh, and since uh, five years ago, violent offending has increased 42%. Let me show you a graph so you can see this as I say it. The blue line, violent offending has increased 42%. Prosecutions have declined for violent offences 13%. Convictions for violent offending has declined 18%. And the number of people sent to prison for violent offending has declined 36%, which is the yellow line. Now, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Bill English, when he opened a forum when he was uh, Deputy Prime Minister, referred to prisons as a moral and fiscal failure. But now National's concerned about the number of people being bailed despite police opposition. It's risen from 2,000 up to 5,000 at the moment. Uh, and of course, we've seen this massive increase in ram raids and 70% of kid, the people involved in ram raids are aged under 18. Uh, there were almost 5,000 retail burglaries, and once again, under 18s. Of the offenders, 51% of them didn't face court action. 
And so what happened to them if they didn't face court action? 112 kids received a family group conference, 43 young people got a formal or informal warning, and 94 kids didn't receive any consequences. Now, I heard a youth worker say today that this reflects a healthy functioning system that the youth are getting the support and services they need. So a simple question to go around the panel is, what's a social conservative response to crime? Is it more prisons to be tougher or more counselling, more family group conferences? Uh, let's start with you, Alfred. Oh, well, it's, um, it's all of the above because each one play, plays a role. In reality, you can't say you can't have one or the other. Prisons play a role because when people cross the line, right, when they do break the laws, they have to be held accountable. But at the same time, what we're missing, Bob, is that we know what the drivers of crime are and we're not actually attending to it. Look, over 35% of males that are in prison, predominantly Māori and Pacifica, right, have literacy issues. Why? Because it goes back to education. So there's a, a stream there. We're talking about the breakdown of the family, right? We're not talking about... These are things that we've known about, but we want to fix the widgets because they make us look good politically. But the truth is, it's not an either-or. It's a combination of all of those things, but making sure that actually when people do the crime, it's not just about doing the time, but you've got to be held accountable. And accountability is not just for the perpetrator uh, of the crime, but also to what do we need to do to help the families and to support the community. It's a whole systems approach, not just the one thing that we focus on. Okay, Christine, you've been involved in this space for a long time. Um, what's your thoughts? Look, I agree really with everything that Alfred has just said. And this is the result of a woke government who has instructed the police and judges not to allow people to go to prison. And it's just one of the things that you can do. But this is to make it look as though they're reducing crime. And we all know that crime is escalating wildly. Um, it's just another thing to despair over, really. I don't know how... When we talk tonight about all the social issues that are happening in this country at the moment, it does feel quite overwhelming. And you think, mm. who can fix it? And how can we fix it? And we've got practical, sensible ideas. There's no one to implement those. That's what it feels like to me. No one wants to listen to the Conservatives. OK, do you agree with that, uh, Ronji? Yeah, I, I do, actually. I think there's something really broken within our justice system. I've been looking at uh, the Ministry of Justice police data for a long time. I just can't make sense of it. Really, the stats are pointing to the fact that we are getting softer on crime in some way, shape or form. There's no real fear or deter deterrent anymore when it comes to the police or to the justice system process. And I think if I can offer some sort of solution we have an offender-centric justice system, and I would really mm. challenge that and go against that. We mm. need to have a victim-centered uh, or survivor-centered uh, system where we're building the proper su uh, supports around that person rather than giving all the aroha and support and too much emphasis on the offender and, and the one that's perpetrated the crime. We need to be able to try and make sure that that victim or that survivor has mana, has support, has the ability to stand in and share about those experiences and find some sort of healing and restoration in some way, shape or form. I think that's what shifts the system, shift it away from an offender centric system to a victim or survivor centered system. OK, Ashley, you agree with that? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, if you look at those from a reactionary perspective, it's pretty easy to look at those numbers and see that, that as, as consequences and prosecutions and what have you have gone down, mm. that, that offences have gone up. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to make that connection. But, but for me, you've actually got to, you've got to remember that, that the prison system doesn't operate in isolation. It's part of a broader society, which over the last 50 years has become increasingly immoral, post-Christian. It shouldn't surprise us that in a society where we've moved away from traditional values and the stuff that we grew up with, that probably acted as a self-regulation on a lot of us in terms of the sorts of things that we did and the behaviours that we engaged in, shouldn't surprise us that that society is becoming um, more criminal, for want of a better word. So for me, there's actually the, the, this stuff's not difficult. It's, 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 it's a, a bigger picture about where our society's heading and how you fix that, because that's a real question for me. That's, that's, a, that's a much, much larger issue. OK, and Bruce, you get the final word on this topic and for the night. Well, the, I think the real issue is what it means to be human. And if I can summarize, uh, and by quoting my favorite, one of my favorite economists, an American treasure, Thomas Sowell, he's got this idea of two visions of society. 
One he calls the constrained vision, and the other he calls the unconstrained vision. The constrained vision believes that human nature requires constraint. Problems of the world are not just the result of some one person or some group. Many things like the distribution of health, wealth, skill and enthusiasm are intrinsic to being alive. Hard work and sacrifice can improve a lot, providing we take note of the constraints. We can't abolish them. The unconstrained vision presumes that the only reason why everyone does, doesn't get everything they want is because they are deprived by corrupt institutions and selfish rulers. And we have got into the situation now where we no longer believe in the importance of restraint and the need for restraint because we've got this idea that we are naturally good and we can create ourselves and we can do all sorts of things and kids can do anything and that they don't need to be guided that somehow or other they will flower if they're put in the right kind of classroom or given the right kind of ideology to shape their thinking. And the constrained view, or rather the unconstrained view, is held by children and the constrained view by adults. The problem is that the adults are becoming fewer on the ground and that makes education a thing of something of a shambles. All That's right. the way I think it's here. Great way to sum it up. It's past uh, Ronji's bedtime. And um, good news, everybody, uh, because we're family first, next Monday is Easter Monday, so it's a public holiday. So we are going to give the panellists the week off, and we will be back in two weeks. Uh, but we're in for the long haul through to the election. We'll be here every Monday night. So uh, thank you to the panellists, Alfred, Bruce, Ronji, Ashley, Christine. Thank you so much. Have a lovely Easter weekend, and we will see you back here in two weeks for Straight Talk. Have a great week. Thank you, you too. Paul.